I have a neighbor, one of my dear friends, white guy who lives across the street. And he called me for vacation. Hey Shola, I have a bunch of Amazon boxes packed outside of my front door. Would you mind heading over to my house and grabbing those packages from my front porch and bringing them back to your house? And then I'll get them after I get back from vacation. Hell no. What? Are you crazy? There's no way I'm going to a house that is not mine, picking up packages that do not belong to me, carry them back to my house. Do you not see how they can play out poorly for me? But that's the beauty of these conversations, right? It's a neighborly thing. Yeah, it's all good. It's like, nah, man. Because I will be face down in the pavement, potentially shooting first, asking questions later. And my goal, I'm getting home with my family. But I think these conversations help to kind of let people know like, oh, that's a thing. It's a thing. It's a story of my life. I did read your book, Civil Unity. You talk a lot about you know, your childhood and your current work. And, and so I want to just dive a little bit deeper into, into how you were sort of shaped to become the person that you are today. Uh, you, you told the mosquito story about your dad and your TEDx talk, which was yeah. an awesome story. <laughs> and he sounds like a fascinating character, man. Super smart, PhD philosopher yep. mm -hmm. and you described him as emotionally intelligent in the book but he's also from sierra leone and yes. i found that a lot of men from you know these west african countries can be very sort of masculine yep. and stoic and you describe yourself as an empath so how was it growing up in that household, <laughs> it's, you know, with, with someone who was, who I'm, I'm assuming was very strong, strong, masculine figure. How, how did he relate to your, uh, you described yourself as an HSP, a highly sensitive person. Yeah. You know, it's funny growing up. I didn't realize that I was a highly sensitive person until probably later on in my life, but my dad, mm -hmm. Because you're absolutely right. There's a there's a generalization which is based in some level of truth that a lot of West African men, and of course I'm generalizing as well, are hyper masculine and really focus on a lot of traditional um, values around what masculinity looks like. My dad was kind of different in that sense. He was an intellectual, as you mentioned, a philosopher. He and a philosopher not in terms of his career, but he was a college professor who loved to philosophize about a lot of different things very sensitive, very thoughtful, very emotionally connected. So emotionally intelligent, absolutely. Even on top of that, he was very connected to people. It, there was a story he told me, I'll never forget. So my dad was, uh, did lectures as a college professor. He would go to other events, maybe other campuses to speak potentially. And this was, gosh, had to be in like the 1980s probably. And he was invited to speak somewhere and uh, he was going to be speaking later in the day. So he came in his jeans, very casual gear. And a woman came up to him and was like, hey, I need a coffee. Get me some coffee. Um, or there's, we're out of coffee at this table. Go get me some coffee. And my dad was like, oh, okay. And he went and got some coffee. He knew what was going on. He got the coffee and she was like, yeah, thanks. Anyway, and this kind of dismissed him and moved on. So he ended up sitting at a table kind of near where she was. And she assumed that he was the work, like it was so, someone that was serving food or just being a hired hand, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So then the person who's running this event was like, hey, I'm so happy to share with you our keynote speaker. The, this, is, uh, this man is just, his research, blah, 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 and on and on and on. And then seeing... My dad stand up and walk to the stage. He was like, that was just beautiful. I was like, dad, how did you have the self-control to do that? Because I mean, I'm like, don't you know who I am? How dare you get me, get your own copy. Then he was like, no, he was able to tap into something that was so powerful. And this goes back to the stories around his emotional intelligence, his self-control, his restraint, because he dealt with a lot of challenges growing up. A lot of challenges as he got older, a lot of challenges in his career, professional jealousy and other things, racism, to name a few. And he fought through it. And that was my, that was, he was my guy. So that was, he passed in 2019. And growing up with that, I was always like looking at him as like, how does he do this? How can he be so unflappable in the face of 
hideous behavior. Not saying he just accepted it, mind you, because he stood up for himself, but he was able to dismiss some of the worst behaviors possible and move on. And so that was something that I, I took from him growing up. And I think as a highly sensitive person, as you mentioned, started to realize that I also need to have those tools that my dad had. And a lot of it, I kind of packed into the civil unity, my upcoming book as a message for myself. I dedicated the book to myself. I literally right. dedicated the book to myself as someone, the book that I wish I had when I was younger. So you have brothers. I also have brothers. And um, we. I grew up in Alabama. You, you and I are about the same age. Yep. So, you know, down in the South, obviously one of the big topics that everybody, all, black communities talk about is racism, black, mm -hmm. white, you know, and like you have to prepare your sons for the realities of that world. And was that a conversation, an ongoing conversation that you all had coming again from a West African um, father? What was that? What was that like? Absolutely. Because West African dad and a Mississippi woman. So she, my mm -hmm. mom and dad were married for 49 years and together uh, they had some some things for me that still stick with me to this day, Light, if I'm going to be real, like things that seem so silly to some people, but not to you and certainly not to me. Like I, I always get a receipt. I don't care if I'm buying a pack of gum at 7-Eleven. I always have a receipt. <laughs> and so like people are like, remember at the, the grocery receipt? store, you see white people opening chips up in the, in, you know, no, in the actual oh aisle God. and you're like, I could never do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny that you say that. Cause I'm like watching these folks just literally eating chips that they have not yet paid for. It's like, right. God, that must be nice. And I, I was at a rest, <laughs> I was at a restaurant with one of my, with a, um, a group of friends and, and some of them are white and, they we got to the restaurant and there's like tables all over the place and they just start getting up and start moving the tables in the restaurant together to make it work for them so we have i'm like wow and i had to be like y'all just went in here and just like you own this place it's like i'm not going here it's like, this is their restaurant and we all had a big laugh together about it because like, oh yeah i never really thought about that but yes these conversations when i was younger were critical for for just not just the small things like getting the receipts and, you know, not staying out after dark. And if you are playing outside, don't run. Be careful around where you're running. Make sure you're in this place because it could look like yeah. you're possibly committing a crime. All these things that a lot of people that may not have to ever experience or even think about that I have to think about on a daily basis. So that was part of it. I got those conversations and to their credit. I think I've been safer because of it. I think I've avoided a lot of things that would have kind of flown over my 10, 11, 12 year old head at the time. And these lessons have stick with me to this day. I have two daughters, still have conversation with them, a little different than I, if they were sons, if I could be quite honest, but still conversations nonetheless. But yeah, it shaped me. And I think I became hyper vigilant and hyper aware of my race because I was very blind to the idea that I was different it, from anyone until I was told that I was. And then that kind of stuck with me and I realized how I have to navigate this world to stay safe and to be productive. Oh man, you just, when you talk about not running, I remember I was about nine or 10, we were at the mall. My brother, you yeah. know, like your parents would drop you off at the mall and just leave you there for like oh, two that, or three yeah, hours. Yeah, story of my life. Yes, with your exactly. friends. Yep. And we would just, and we would just, we had a little, we were playing tag. Yep. So we'd be in a store, one of our friends would tag us and then they'd run out of the store and then we ran out. Anyway, next thing you knew, we were in the back of the store with police officers and because the store owner had called the cops because yep. they thought we were we were stealing stuff and that's, that's right. why we were running. And I didn't realize at the time that I was being profiled because I didn't know what that was. I had no Same. language for that. But when I look back at my youth, I was profiled several times. I remember yep. one time, the cops pulled my brother and I over. We were walking from my grandmother's house back to our, our house, which was probably, you know, like a 10 minute walk. And the cop pulls us over. We're like probably 11 and 12. And we're, he's wearing a red shirt. I'm wearing a green shirt. And the cop says, yeah, we got to call. Somebody's breaking into people's houses. One person, they look like you guys. One is wearing a red shirt. One is wearing a green shirt. I'll go, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, what a coincidence. Yeah, right. You're like, oh, that's <laughs> Interesting. Tell me more about this. Yeah, situation. tell me more about this. <laughs> Not realizing that probably somebody looked out their window and just, yep. you know, called the police on us. Yep. So exactly. And that's wild because I think these conversations 
are hopefully eye-opening to people who don't have to experience this stuff, right? Because I think that's something that I, I, I kind of pride myself on as a teacher. There's a story that, that happened to me uh, kind of during pandemic times, which was interesting. I have a neighbor um, who's since moved, but one of my dear friends, white guy who lives across the street. And he was on vacation with his lovely wife. And he's like, hey, man, he called me from vacation. Hey, Shola, I have a bunch of Amazon boxes packed outside of my front door. Um, and I, I'm not going to really get to them till next week. Would you mind heading over to my house and grabbing those packages from my front porch and bringing them back to your house? And then I'll get them after I get back from vacation. I'm like, hell no. What? Are you crazy? And it's like, there's no way I'm going to a house that's, that is not mine, picking up packages that do not belong to me, carry them back to my house. Do you not see how that can play out poorly for me? Like, oh man, I'm so embarrassed to even ask. But that's the beauty of these conversations, right? Because I would bet that many of my white brethren and sister and, and, uh, and siblings or whomever, well, what just, yeah, man, what's the big deal? It's like, it, cause like, it's, it's a friendly, it's a neighborly thing. Yeah, it's all good. It's like, nah, man, it's like, because I will be face down in the pavement, you know, potentially shooting first, asking questions later. And I'm not, I, I, my goal, I'm getting home to my family. I'm continuing to do the work that I love and I'm going to stay alive for as long as I humanly possibly can. And I'm certainly not gonna do anything that's going to shorten my life if it's intentionally easy for me to avoid doing. So that's really the thing. And I, but I think these conversations help to kind of let people know like, oh, that's a thing. Like, yeah, it's a thing. It's a story of my life. Wait, I got a bet. I got one too. Oh, so please. I was, I'm here for I was it. dating this girl in Venice. She's not black. Okay. Okay. And she's got two dogs and she lives, you know, on a street facing house and she didn't get a chance to walk her dogs. So we were boyfriend and girlfriend. It was Friday night. She calls me and she goes, hey, I'm still stuck at this other place. Would you mind going oh over to my house and walking the dogs? I said, well, I don't have a key. I don't, you know, I don't have the key to your house. Oh, you can just, you know, I, the window's not locked. So you no, can just no. open the front window and go in. That's a setup, <laughs> man. Were you about to break up? <laughs> that's a setup. What? And that's exactly what I thought. I, I just don't feel like getting shot tonight. I don't no, feel like. No, not tonight. No. Going through all that stuff on Friday night. I'm going to go through your front window in Venice. Come on. That's ridiculous. Oh, that is. And she, did, she didn't understand why I had an issue with that. And it's like I couldn't even really explain it to her because, I mean, where do you even start? So wait, she, so that, uh, there's a saying that I, I love. It's like, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. So oh, like, wow. That, I love that. I so, love I mean, that. so if you're sitting here thinking like, well, wait a second. Because my neighbors got it instantly. They knew. They're like, look, I, I, I can, <laughs> that's ridiculous. I even asked, did not think about it. But for your girlfriend at the time, you'd be like, what's the big deal? Just climb to my window. Like, oh, that's wild. That is, that is not okay. So, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's actually really funny because it's like, hey, I'm not, can you climb through my window? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, man, that would have been the end of Light Watkins. We would never, we would never, the show would have never been born. All the lights. <laughs> we wouldn't be having been. this conversation. Oh, right? no, no. We were just sitting here talking about, man, remember that that crazy brother who tried to go right. through our, his girlfriend's window? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah I heard about him. Yeah, you'd be a hashtag, man. That's pretty much it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So take us back to that time. Um, when you were 11, I believe, and you were, you, you were in that classroom in Greensboro. Yeah. Um, actually, before we get to that, you have a twin, you have an identical twin brother. You didn't really talk about that, but I have an Irish twin brother. Oh, he's wow. 11, he's 11 months older than me. So that's what they call Irish twins. Yeah, I know. Familiar, very familiar. Yeah. But mm -hmm. one of the things that kind of was always in the back of my mind as I was going through school was I'm always, every time I go to a class, he's already been there. Like he was there the right, year yeah. before, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't wait to break off, graduate, and go do my own thing without being in my brother's shadow all the time. So, yes, a was your brother in that class with you when that incident occurred? And no. B, talk about the incident. Yeah, so I it was it's funny because it was kind of I never really talked about it much ever, but I felt like when I was writing this book, and I'm going to answer your question. 
I've mm-hmm. written two books before and each book got like more progressively personal. Mm-hmm. And I felt like this one, cause I don't know if I'm gonna write another book again. I just went all in with sharing some things that may be useful to someone. So long story short, my dad had, um, who was a professor at University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And then he ended up going down to University of North Carolina, Greensboro, UNCG to teach for a year. So we moved for a year to this new area, Greensboro, North Carolina. And in my classroom in fifth grade, I was taking a math test and I had to use the restroom like really, really badly. And my teacher was like, no, no, you can go to the bathroom after you finish the test, which I found to be really just unnecessarily strict and borderline cruel. Like I need to use the restroom. I mean, I mean, why would I, I'm not making this up. I'm not going there to like, to like check the answers on my phone. Remember this is like 1984, probably. I just don't mm-hmm. phones back then. So I'm like, look, I need, really need to use the restroom. She's like, quiet. So I'm taking the test line. This is not gonna. This is not gonna work out well for me. And um, I ended up. I was like, I can't. I and I literally just peed all over myself, all over the floor, all over my pants, and it was traumatic, man. Um, because I mean, as a just entering puberty, kind of just kind of getting that energy of like in in a new kid. On top of that, in a new state, a new area, it was really really hard. And I. I remember feeling such deep shame and embarrassment. And when people started to notice what was going on, they saw this puddle pooling under me and everyone starts laughing and the laughter was awful. And to be quite honest, I mean, look, is it too much to ask to think that like 11 and 10 year olds would not laugh at a kid who peed all over himself? Probably too much to ask, but the teacher, I mean, the teacher could have done better. And I remember running to the bathroom I was thinking to myself, like, man, like, why can't people be kinder to each other? Why are people so awful to each other? And I think, and I shared this in Civil Unity, like, this was the origin story. This is where it was. I'm not Spider-Man. I wasn't bitten by a radioactive spider. I'm a cool origin story. This is my story. And in that bathroom, while I'm trying to clean myself up and try to make sense of what happened, I realized, like, this is awful. People are so mean. And I, I... I need to understand why can't we be kinder to each other? And I've been searching for that answer or I was searching for that answer for probably 20 years after that incident, where I was looking for kindness and understanding why people behave in ways that are mean. And I'm grateful for that situation because it uh, opened my eyes up to a few things that I wasn't aware of before. And I think most importantly, allow me to realize that I'm not the only person feeling this way. And if I can help them, if I'm going to be one of these people who have to feel things deeply, then I might as well use this to my benefit, not to my detriment. Do you feel like that moment, and maybe you were already like this, but do you feel like that moment made you have compassion for other people who had very tender, vulnerable experiences occur to them? Because you also talked about shortly before moving there, you those two boys took you into the woods and to show yeah. you something cool and ended up... Mm sexually abusing you. Um, Yeah, it was a lot. So between that situation where I I endured a little bit of sexual, a little bit of sexual abuse, sexual abuse and sexual abuse, and the situation that led into Greensboro, um, I think, I think those two made me more aware, if that makes sense, of other people's suffering because I'm a kid, you know, kids are very self-focused. They're not really thinking about a whole lot besides themselves. So that was something that made me think like, Whoa, there's other people here. Who's probably also hurt too. At the time I felt like I was alone. I was like, maybe I'm the only person dealing with this and worse. I kind of internalized it. Like there must be something wrong with me that people aren't kind to me. And that must be a problem that I'm dealing with. So all these things together created an environment where, I felt awful, but I did start to notice as I got older, not quite at that time, but as I got older, wow, there's other people who are struggling too. And maybe, maybe if I can talk to some of these people or connect to some of these people who are struggling, maybe we can find a way to come out of this together. And that was kind of the beginning of that thought. But now as a nearly 50 year old man, I have deep compassion for others in ways that I never thought possible. I just see, 
I see the pain in people and I'm focused on doing whatever I can to alleviate it. It's, it's exhausting light sometimes <laughs> to be honest, but, uh, but I feel like there's no other way that I want to live than being in the service of helping others. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. One more question about those moments. How did your, did your parents find out you, you peed on yourself and, or did you kind of conceal it and, and, and just, just hold that in, hold that in for yeah. years and years and years. And how did they sort oh. of deal with that or deal with similar situations? Were they protective? Were they the helicopter or they say you just figured out for yourself? No, they're always, they're super compassionate and kind, which is great, which I love about my parents. Um, I did share it. I mean, not in like the painstaking detail, because I was afraid if I don't share it and it goes back to them, then it's going to be maybe shared in a way that's not accurate or potentially, you know, overblown. And I just want to be the one to kind of preemptively be like, hey, so something happened in class and really embarrassing. And they're super supportive. They're like, they're like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Pee on the like, oh gosh, that must have been awful. I'm just, that's so embarrassing. I can't imagine how awful that must have been for you. And mm -hmm. that's the reason why I can tell my parents anything. I mean, I've had this relationship with my parents where I don't feel like I need to hide stuff from them. And I think that's also been very helpful now with me and my daughters, where I can talk to them and they can feel like they can talk to me about anything. So that's why I, I want to create that environment of vulnerability, psychological safety, freedom to be who you are so you can say what you need to say. Because a lot of people are afraid to keep it real because they're afraid of being judged. And I've feel, felt that fear for a while, but I never felt that with my parents. And now that I'm a parent myself, I'm making sure that my girls never feel that with me. Okay, beautiful. So a couple more questions about your younger years. How did you... Um, what was your idea of success, right? Obviously your dad's role model. I'm not sure what your mom was doing at that time, but she's, when you thought yeah, she, was of, in sort of, she was in healthcare. Okay. So yeah. projecting ahead as a young person now, not you looking back, but as a young person, what were you, what were you seeing as, okay, if I, when I do this, then I'm going to be successful. I think success for me was my parents, meaning that they were able to have a house and mm -hmm have a working vehicle and they're smart and they're educated. So to me, it's like, if I can do this, if it's a lot of kids like, hey, I want to be a professional athlete. I want to be a fireman. I want to be an astronaut. I was like, I just want to be my mom or my dad. I want to be either one of them. If I can find a way to do something, they both were very good at what they did. They're very well respected in the community. They had a beautiful house and they took care of themselves in a way that they didn't need to ask anyone for anything. I noticed that even at a young age, I was like, man, this would be great. And they told me later on, like, listen, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. We were struggling. Um, we didn't share that with y'all because, you know, you're little. How are you going to help out? That doesn't help you, like, make you scared. But at the same time, they, it wasn't an act because they weren't acting. They just made sure there's certain things that we just didn't need to know about. And they made it work. And I can't say enough about them. So for what I think about success at that age, it was like, man, if I can just have a house, if I can have a car and I have work with a bank account with some money in it, I mean, I'm going to be chilling because that's, it seems to be working for them. So it would work for me too. And that was it. That's all I needed. Funny. Uh, I just thought about something else you and I, cause you and I are about the same height and yeah. you know, when you grow up as a tall black guy, you, yeah. you have to answer that same question oh, over yes. and over and over. Are you a oh, basketball yeah. player? Are you a basketball, basketball player? player. Yeah. You're actually an NBA fan. I'm not really that much into basketball. And I did play a little bit recreationally, but I was no means you're going to be on anybody's team or anything like that. I remember, I remember once, though, I was in this fancy hotel in Beverly Hills. I forget. Do you know the one on Wilshire next to Saks Fifth Avenue? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I not can't the Beverly remember. Hilton. Are we talking about the Beverly it's Hilton? It's not the Hilton. It's, it starts with a P, I think. But anyway, I was at this conference that Deepak Chopra was hosting. Oh, wow. Okay. Scientists and sages. So everyone there nice. was either a scientist or a philosopher or something. And I'm in the elevator That's with this old white lady going to the conference. And she, of course, looks at me and goes, do you play for the Lakers? 
And oh, in that moment, I just got God. so tired of that question. I just said, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I knew. I mean, that was probably the thousandth time I'd ever been asked a question of, about basketball. But it's Brother, like, yeah. I, I mean, I knew yeah, that like, before like, you even shared that story, I knew where it was going. I was flying to uh, Salt Lake City. and If you're in first event. class, you're a basketball player. Oh, no doubt. So if I'm sitting in seat 2C, it's like, do you play for the Utah Jazz? I'm like, so unlike you, I, I just was like, I couldn't do it. I was you like, try to educate them. Yeah, like, like no, do, and I was like, and it was like, and there was a woman. Was like, no, do you play for the Jazz? Well, what type of question is that? I'm a woman. Yeah, and I'm a black man who just happens to be on this plane. And guess what? Don't have to play basketball. I don't do that. For I did play college basketball, but I don't play it now. And she's like, oh, oh, okay, just, just, just wondering. And I think there's a time where we have to make a decision between three questions. Like, do you address it now? Do you address it later? Or do you let it go? And it depends on my mood. And, you know, sometimes it's like, you taught jazz? Like, that is wild. I mean, it's like, I, I just like to think so narrowly of an entire group of people that make up 13% of our population here in the United States is just shocking to me everyone who's over the height of five foot ten must be an nba basketball player they can't be a scientist they can't be a philanthropist they can't be a fortune 50 ceo like so i try to i try to educate with love whenever i can and um depending on my mood sometimes i just let it go but that we both because we're tall black men uh and I think the shaved head also kind of adds a little bit to it. Like, oh, man, kind of like that Michael Jordan energy. I don't know. But it's just like, it's laughable. But some days you just got to just, sometimes you just got to address it. <laughs> just have to say something. So Lewis House had this guy, uh, no, he had Larry King on his podcast. And then Larry was telling a story about this cop that was shot by this kid when he when he approached the kid in Central Park. The kid was on like a new bicycle, a brand new Schwinn bicycle. And he went to approach him because he thought maybe the kid had stolen the bicycle. And the kid pulls out a little pistol and shoots the cop. And come to find out, that cop was like the fifth cop that had pulled this kid over that day to ask about his bicycle. Mm. And he, just, he, had just, he had just lost it. And I think that's what people don't appreciate when someone overreacts to one yeah. of those, what seems like an innocent question. It's like, exactly. we've been asked that question a thousand times. And it's not to say that oh, it's justified for you to overreact, but that's why those kind of things can happen sometimes. Is I, don't that's so it. well said. I so well said, because I think it's like this idea of like, what's the big deal? And yeah. if you take it in isolation, you're absolutely right. It's not really a big deal. But it's this whole death by a thousand paper cuts thing where it happens over and over and over and over and over again. And by the 23rd, 25th time this happened, you're just like, you know what? Like, stop. <laughs> like, so I, I completely, I'm not justifying obviously what he did, um, but I, it's, I, I think it's, it offers some insight and some understanding about why someone gets pushed to the edge when it happens that often. Yeah. All right. So give us a montage. Where'd you go to college? How did that, what did you, what are we going to do for a living? Talk, talk about your early days in the professional career leading up to that toxic job that you oftentimes refer to in your talks. Yeah. I mean, I worked, I was, uh, I went to school at a small liberal arts school in upstate New York called Union College in Schenectady, New York. Great school. Um, got my bachelor's in psychology there. That's really where I kind of really learned about you know, organizational psychology and the idea of, because again, the, the fascination was why do people act the way that they do? Um, and it was a very, very interesting uh, environment for me to, to learn in, to, I was challenged a lot. There was, you know, some really fabulous academic rigor at Union College that allowed me to kind of go deeper into this and i was like you know what i don't know what the hell i'm gonna do with this career <laughs> but i mean because i didn't want to be a therapist um i didn't want to be that person but i did want to figure out how we show up affects how we work and that was something that i was fascinated by really didn't have a plan on that uh going into it i was just like let's give it a try let's see what happens so i started working and 
I started entering the working world and I saw a lot of really interesting behaviors that were wildly toxic and strange. And, and, and I began to think maybe this is just how the working world is. Maybe this is how people operate. Maybe people are just rude and unkind generally. And so I need to toughen my skin up a little bit and quit being a baby and figure it out. And that was my understanding. I was so sensitive and because I'm a sensitive person that I just couldn't understand, like, why are people acting this way? This makes no sense. And it would hurt me to the point where I would just almost become debilitated. It was really, really tough. Um, but then I would lean into my psychology and I'd lean into just like trying to be curious and I could only take that so far. Uh, until I eventually had the point where I've dealt with enough unkindness in my life that I was just like, screw it. <laughs> I can't, I can't go much farther with this. I just, well, I can't. What, what, can you give us some examples? What are you referring to? Like stuff you'd see in like the office where people are just condescending, incompetent, uh, insensitive. Yeah, it was, it ranged from condescending, rude, you know, that type of stuff. Taking to, credit that they didn't deserve. Oh, yeah. Throwing people under things. the bus. All that fun <laughs> stuff. To like really like picking me out as a target. I was a high performer <laughs> in this particular place. And I, I, and I was a high performer doing what I felt was just, you know, good work. And people hated it because I was relatively new and I was able to climb up pretty quickly. And we're like, there's rankings of where people were. And I people do kind of crazy stuff to break me. I, I share my keynotes as one example where I brought like a turkey sandwich to lunch and these um, colleagues of mine, when I went to go to the cubicle to make a call, they would run to the break room fridge, pull my sandwich out of my lunch bag and step on it, literally step on it. So I see the footprint in the bread and then put it back in the lunch bag, like crazy cartoonishly stupid stuff. And, you know, it made me start to question like, what in the world is wrong with humanity that this would be considered okay? And, but my self-esteem was so low and I was starting to fall into a little bit of depression. When I started to really realize that I'm a little predisposed to a lot of depressive episodes and just depression in general, I was like, man, it must be me. I'm, I'm not good. Not see these type of things happen to everyone else. Everyone else seems to be fine. Everyone else seems to be good. It must be me. And that's when I realized if it is me and I'm not worthy of kindness from other people, then um, I should probably do something to leave this world because I can't stand to be in it. Was this a job where your boss punched you in the face? No, no. And it wasn't in the face, thankfully. <laughs> no. But no, but she did punch me. She punched me in the shoulder. She was mad that I did not uh, follow her orders to the T. So no, it was not that, thankfully. A different that job. was another job before yeah, this job. After. <laughs> after. Oh, after. after this job. Yeah, okay. so I was like, I, but I, it, I'm grateful, Light. I'm grateful. I'm grateful, as weird as this may sound to some, because I have empathy for people who work in terribly awful work environments. There are folks who do this work of trying to help heal workplaces and all their experience is from a master's level textbook or from professors or from seminars. I live this stuff. So someone can roll up to me right now like, oh man, you don't know what it's like to deal with a boss that's toxic. You don't know what it's like to work in an environment where people don't respect you. Like, oh, hold up fam, let me, let, let me educate you real quick. I do understand deeper than you could ever, ever know and Let's talk about it because I think that empathy allows someone to be like, oh, he's a real one. He understands it versus because I can talk about it intellectually, but I can also talk about it experientially. So I've gone through it. And that to me, I feel allows for a little bit more credibility in these conversations because I know what it's like and I can talk to someone from a place of shared understanding, which I think has been really helpful for me throughout my career so far. So I just want to fill in some of the other um, gaps just to give more context to this next pivotal part in your story. Um, you mentioned that you started to have episodes of depression and mm -hmm. I'm imagining that, you know, you had been holding this repression in for such a long time from these other things where 
you had been targeted as a young person and now you're 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 very active with therapy and all of that did you were you seeing a therapist at the time and no. and so how were you sort of attempting to process this toxicity at the time and then also talk a little bit about what was going on in your personal life i know you had got married i'm not sure if 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 Kaya and, and Nia were on the scene at the time or how yeah. they were. But yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about what was going on at home while you were dealing with all this toxicity at work. Yeah. So at the time, um, I was, I just met my girlfriend who is now my wife. So Amber. yeah, Amber. So the girls, Kaya and Nia came later. So I was just started dating Amber and you know, it was, things were great, but I, I didn't feel, I, I was conditioned not by my parents, but by other friends and stuff like that. Like, oh man, therapies for crazy white folks and this, that, and the other. So I never, <laughs> right. you know, all the stuff that a lot of black folks here growing up. So I didn't, I didn't feel like, why would I do that? I, I'm not crazy. I'm not, you know, I'm not some person who needs to go to a mental asylum and be in a straitjacket. It was this weird mischaracterizations of mental health and mental health care. Mm -hmm. So I was not into that. So I did not do anything. So for me, a lot of stuff was kind of maladaptive. I would, you know, every now and then drink maybe more than I should, uh, just kind of bury myself in, you know, I played basketball. So I played basketball after work and use that as a distressor, try to over exercise if that even the thing. I ran from it, everything except for sit and stare at the pain in the face. And that's why I use the term maladaptive because it wasn't really affecting. The, it was a way to kind of smooth out the edges a little bit and maybe give me a bit, bit of peace temporarily, but never really addressing the issue because I never really addressed the issue. You know, the monster under the bed got scarier and stronger and bigger until it overwhelmed me. And I think that's a lesson that now I know very very well to address these things if you just like if you had a lump under your rib cage you're like oh man i'm not i'm just gonna ignore it the type of person i was to give you a better insight is when i was younger my brakes were grinding on my car and because the brake pads were gone and so when i would break it would grind so what i did instead of going to get them fixed i would just turn the radio up really really loud when i'm driving so i wouldn't wow. hear the grinding like that's literally like a metaphor and that's not even a metaphor because that's literally what I did. But metaphorically speaking, it, it does fit how I saw life. I was like, if I just find a way to drown out the noise with something louder, then I won't hear it. And then it will go away. And predictably and unsurprisingly, it never did. And you said you wrote that the decision to end it all was... Um, it, it it didn't take a lot of energy to arrive at that conclusion. You spent more time figuring out your fantasy football yeah. you know, lineup and things like that. So so let's go to this day now, right? You you wake up, you decide today is the day I can't do this for another even thirty minutes, much mm -hmm. less thirty years. So, and are you living with Amber at the time? Um, no, still kind of in separate apartments, but we're okay. like seeing each other often, but not quite to that level yet. Okay. So just walk us through like what you were thinking. How did you, what, how did you come up with your plan and, and then what, what happened? How did it all play out? Pr pretty straightforward. I just woke up and I was like, you know what? I, this doesn't feel good anymore. I feel like this pain is overwhelming. I looked at the alarm clock and after hitting snooze, however many times, like, damn it, I got to go to this job because I got to pay rent and, you know, be able to care for myself. I'm like, let's go. I went down the freeway in the 405. I was like, you know what? I can't do this. Like then just and there's a voice in my head. Just, just do it. Just turn the steering wheel, man. Just make it happen. Just do it. And I was like, because I would never be the type of person who would violently end my life through like shooting myself or slashing my wrist and having someone find me is because of a, I was a highly sensitive person that would not compute in my head, but making it look like an accident sounds like a great idea. So it was like this way I could be absolved of any wrongdoing, relatively speaking, and no one would ever know the truth. And that was something that I tried. And so when I got to a spot that I felt was like, okay, this seems safe. And I just 
it's not so erotic. Safe meaning Especially. you're not going to injure anybody else. Exactly, exactly. Because that was something that I was very thoughtful of at the time. Like I don't want to. I just want. I just want to leave. I no one needs to come with me. This is not their fight or their challenge or their problem. This is my problem, and this is how I chose to solve it. And thankfully, I tried, and the guardrail held, and I came back in incoming traffic, and that's what I spent some time thinking about. What actually happened? Did you like how, how to what degree were you turned towards this thing? Were you heading straight to it or was it no. just like you brushed against it? And yeah, so I went and so I'm on. Like the if right. I was driving behind you, what would I have seen? You would see me sharply go towards the guardrail as if like I would spilled hot coffee on myself or something. And I just mm -hmm. went there and kind of hit the guardrail and then ended up on the shoulder. Did you stop? And that's what, yeah, stop. Yeah. Because I've seen point, these documentaries where these people, they jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and they say, the moment I jump, I was like, what am I doing? Oh, yeah. no, this mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do this. Yeah, every, every, yeah, the, that I've never seen that documentary, but I can tell you that, that was my story. So as soon as I came back and then coming traffic, what in the, I have no idea. And part of suicide, and I'm only speaking for myself because like, obviously stories are very completely varied and individually uh, focused on the person. For me, I, when I did it, I attempted, I felt this feeling of a lack of hope. There was just nothing there. So I was like, what am I doing? And so when I came back into con incoming traffic, all my humanity rushed back to me. I just started sobbing and crying, ugly cry, stuff that was so deeply repressed for years rushed up to the surface and it was overwhelming but it was also this release that i was like i said tamp this down and try to keep it down push through what i was like oh my god and it was it was beautiful in the sense it wasn't beautiful at the time but looking back on it it was a beautiful moment because i was like wow all this feeling all this stuff decades of pain has now been released and i'm like all right enough <laughs> And I decided from that point forward, I was like, and, in, and even since, because it's been probably 20, over 20 years ago, I'll never let myself get to that place again. I'll never allow that to happen. And that's when I started realizing that I need to be taking care of my own mental health and really removing myself from really deeply toxic environments. And that environment was awful. And, but there's been other scents that aren't great. But now I feel like I have the tools to help myself. And now because of such, I have the tools to help others in the same situation. I don't mean to get too personal about this. Um, but I'm, again, I'm, I'm asking these questions thinking that somebody else may be out there, you know, who, who could use this, this knowledge. You're now known for speaking about this. The, you, this mm -hmm. is a part, this is like probably the peak part of your talks, mm. but I'm sure at the time you didn't know that that was going to be happening. And I'm sure no. that maybe you were even majorly embarrassed that you had tried to kill yourself. So yep. how would what, what, talk about those next few days? Like, would, this, would you play it off? Did you tell somebody, Hey, this, guess yeah. what I just tried to do? Cause yeah. this is not something that people usually can handle. No, you know, they're, they're going to try to like, you know, they're going to overreact and maybe you don't even want that. But yeah. I'm just curious when you look back, what did you do? What did you do well to handle it? What could you have done better to sort of navigate that <laughs> that moment after the fact, after you tried to commit suicide? I, I didn't. I and in fact, a couple of things. Um, I never. I, I didn't. There's nothing that I handled well. Um, I will also uh, nothing, nothing, I, none of it. So all of it. And I, with with love, like one of the things often. <laughs> Is people use the term commit suicide and commit suicide likens suicide to a crime like you know committing murder or committing uh bank fraud so with love i was like when you attempted suicide or die by suicide but like committing suicide but that's just one of those phrases that i think we we when we move past it it kind of allows people to lean into more empathy towards folks instead of potentially criminalizing the act of just that's one thing, but I, I also, but I want to share what, cause your question is really powerful. What did I do? It, it was awful. I didn't do anything. So like one thing I didn't do is I didn't share my suicide attempt with anyone for 11 years, 11 years, 11, 11 years, including my wife. So Not even 11 your girlfriend, years. 
Nope. Girlfriend. Go, What's wife? that gas in your car? What? what yeah, I mean, <laughs> right there. Oh, cars. I don't know, man. People are weird. Parking strange, you know? Like, I don't even know what <laughs> silliness I use. That's my excuse. I, but I would, but I never, never told anyone. Hmm. And um, I, so that was probably the first thing that I did wrong. Um, second thing in my defense, though, I didn't really, I didn't really categorize what I did as a suicide attempt. I was just like, oh man, I mean, as strange as this may sound now, but I just like, oh, I just wanted to just be done with it. I tried to drive off, but I bounced back. I mean, this whole thing took like what, seven, 10 seconds, 15 maybe. So it was so fast that I was just like, eh, I'm fine. I'm still here. Let's move on. Even though I started sobbing and coming back to it, I was like, it wasn't that serious. Cause like maybe it was even a sign that maybe I'm not meant to do that. Maybe I'm meant to. Still yeah, do exactly. And I, so I didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it, but what I did do, because I was very emotional at the time. And I think that emotional was my release. And once I had that emotional release, I was like, okay, that was a close call. Let's move on. But the problem still remained. I was still depressed. So that didn't change because I did this and survived. It was because I just was still in a dark place. It was a really dark place. So afterward, I spent a lot of time. I quit on the spot, um, that job, with no money in savings. And yeah, man, it was, it was tough. It was really, really tough. I had to take out like a predatory loan just to be able to survive. Um, it was a really awful time. And I think about that. I wouldn't have done it any differently because the only option I had was to continue to go to work and get a paycheck from these people. But at the same time, I'm like, no, I, I have to make a decision. And I did. And I made a really tough one, but it was the best decision I've made in my life. But what eventually happened was after a period of time of just lying in bed, it's like, I got to do something. I'm going to like, I'm just going to do, well, I'm brush my teeth today, or I'm going to get outside and let some, you know, the, the sun hit my skin and like I started cascading these little wins together where I was like building upon each win. I was like, all right, I'm going to do this today. I'm going to do this today. I'm going to do this today. And then before you know it, thankfully it was really at a point where I finally was able to be like, wow, I'm in a better place now. And even at that time, I still didn't really engage in therapy because I still had really bad, um, misconceptions and stereotypes around therapy, but I started reading books and started leaning into that because I'm a reader. This is not a virtual background. I read a lot. Um, what was like, and, what were some of your gateway books at that time too? At the time I was into uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer and mm -hmm. he has a book called The Power of Intention, which is one of my all time favorites. And I got into his work a lot. Um, I remember Ianla Van Zant had a really powerful book. Like one day my soul just opened up. I read a lot of like Tony Robbins stuff as well. Um, a, the, a lot of folks that were kind of in this self empowerment space and spiritual space, I found to be really attractive to me. So I just started diving into books. They were my therapy. They were the ones who helped me and having these luminaries share their wisdom that was hard fought and hard won over decades of their life and sharing it in a condensed version of a book for me to consume was a dream. I was like, this is amazing. I can just take and drink from these luminaries anytime I want. When I'm in dark space, I can go to my book. And so that served as my therapy going forward for many, 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 many years. And in some cases, as I'm still sitting here now on this podcast, it was very helpful for me to have that as my, my, my refuge and quite frankly, as my guidance. And that was a big, they played a big role in me kind of taking care of my life and taking control of my future going forward. Were you also applying for jobs at that time? Or were you thinking, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start doing something different, switch careers. Um, Cause ultimately you become a keynote speaker and, yes. and an author. So talk, I guess, give us another montage going from that moment where you're lying in bed, ordering food, not wanting to do anything, <laughs> but make, having these little wins to you sort of rebounding to the next stage of your professional life. Yeah. So I was applying for jobs at that point because I, the, that loan was, that was not. <laughs> you had to start paying that 25% oh interest God, back. Man, it was insane. <laughs> it was like doubling every month. It was right. awful. Uh, but I was like, I got to figure this out. I got to do something. So I uh, was starting applying for jobs. And one job that was really appealing to me 
was a job of being like a training specialist, a corporate trainer, going into places and training on topics. And this job at UCLA Health came up as a training specialist and training on things like appointment scheduling and uh, appointment registration and customer service. I was like, this sounds amazing. Mind you, I don't know anything about healthcare besides seeing my mom work in that field. I don't have any real training background, but I was like, I can learn, I can figure this out. And so I applied and I had to give a little perform, not performance, a, a, a kind of a training, like a little practice training to kind of see if I could do it. And I did it and I did it well and I got hired on the spot. And this was the job at UCLA was one of if the best things that ever happened to me in my life. I was able to have this environment where I was speaking in front of audiences. Now, mind you, these weren't like, they're like 10 people with computers in their faces as they're learning how to schedule appointments. But I was able to talk in front of them and engage them. And I would add little stories and humor to make the stories around each patient has a story. This person's coming in because maybe they need to reschedule their appointment because something happened to them at work. And this is where you need to lean into empathy and thoughtfulness as you're talking to and giving this realism behind the story of just, oh, here's how you reschedule an appointment. Type AR into the screen and that means appointment reschedule. Like that's what a lot of trainers did. I was like, no, I wanna put stories behind it. And people are like, wow, I don't wanna to go to, I wanna to go to his class. I wanna to go to his class. And then words start getting out about me as this training specialist, like, wow, he's pretty good. And long story short, um, as I did this, I started getting an appetite or an energy for like speaking. I started feeling like, maybe I'm not that bad at this. Maybe I could do this. And I started getting promoted. I went to lead training specialist to then training manager and then to train, then director of training for the entire enterprise of UCLA Health. That's when I realized like, wow, maybe there's something here. I'm good at this. But then it started to morph into, hey, like we really enjoy your presentations. And when you perform, when you present in front of the leadership team, you remind me of uh, Tony Robbins. And it's kind of funny because these are the books I was reading. I was like, wow, that's a compliment. Like ever thought about maybe doing speaking for a living? I was like, I, uh, that's a thing. Like people actually get paid to speak for a living. Like you should look it up, man. You're, you're, you're pretty good. You know? And then I did, I researched it and I was like, huh. And then I tried to speak once at an event and it went really well. And then, as time went on, I had to make a decision. I had my job at UCLA, and now I have a team that I'm supervising. And then on the other hand, I have now two books, the two, oh, I can't really see them, but the two behind me um, that I wrote in my free time in between work and parenting my kids and being a good husband, trying to be anyway. And I was like, I got a decision to make. Am I gonna jump for the boat, which is UCLA Health, or, or the boat, which is my speaking career, or stay on the pier, which is my job here at UCLA Health. And I decided to make the jump for my speaking career in 2018. I left to do this full time and never looked back. And I'm so grateful for it. One of the best decisions I've ever made. Uh, Making Work Work was published in 2016. Was that, was that, how, how did that come about? Did, was that self-published or did you get a book deal? And, and so how did you secure that? Just for yeah. people listening who are thinking about writing something, how does that work? Yeah, lots of stuff that I left out in that really short uh, <laughs> as explanation of my career at UCLA Health. So basically, um, I yes, I decided after my previous toxic job and then I finally went to a great place like UCLA Health, I decided that I'm going to, I'm a writer. So I'm going to start a blog about how we can create a better work environment. You know, I'm writing this, that, and the other, and, you know, two followers turned to four, four turned to eight, eight to 16, 1632, 64, 128 on it went. So it started to build and I'm able to get some writing reps. And but this is back in like 2011 when like blogs were like the hottest thing ever. And my blog was pretty good. And I was like, I'm going to call it the positivity solution around how to be positive at work. And people dug it. And I started to get posting every week, every Monday, specifically on Mondays, because people hate Mondays. So I was like, let me give you something on Monday to look forward to. So I posted every week. Eventually, a literary agent out of New York City was like, wow, this guy's a pretty good writer. And he's like, hey, do you have a book in you? I'm like, first of all, I thought it was like, 
totally some of my friends setting me up or something but then i realized oh she's legit and then i was like yeah i think i do i was like all right well let's think about if you had a book what would it look like like outline the chapters create a book proposal and let's see if we can shop it around and i did and then the book proposal was well received it was went traditional publishing uh with a group called sterling publishing out of new york and it was beautiful i had two book deal so I wrote Making Work Work and Go Together on the same deal. And then later on, like last year, I switched publishers and took those two books to Forbes books because um, for whatever reason, the publishing agreements was a little weird. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to switch to Forbes and my two books live there. And that's where my third book, Civil Unity, is going to be coming out as well. Um, but I can tell you the whole process of writing books I, if there's anyone listening to this who is a writer or doesn't believe that they're a writer, maybe that's more accurate, at least it was for me, I, I found one book to be the one book that was so helpful for me. And it's, I know it's behind me somewhere. Uh, the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Is that book, man, that book changed me. And when I needed to figure out how to write and when I couldn't get past my own limitations and resistance, Woo, that book saved me. So I tell people, oh, I'm struggling to write. Go get yourself The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield and sit with that book and then come to me later and then we can have a conversation. And usually people are like, That's exactly I how I got my first book written. Is yes, tell me about that. I mean, I know this is, my, please, I'm curious. Like, three how years did of stopping, starting, overthinking, not ready, taking three months off, going back to it for two weeks. And then I'm in Whole Foods in Venice and I run into a friend of mine who had just finished a screenplay and I was telling him, oh, I'm still struggling with this book. He said, dude, go get yourself a copy of The War of Art. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I did. And, you know, it's a really quick book to re read it in yep. a day, essentially. But yep. that is really, it's overnight. I went from an amateur to being a professional and showing up every day. And I say the same thing to people, get yourself a copy of The War of Art. In fact, Stephen Pressfield has been on this podcast. A few no times. way! Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I'm a huge fan. So like, we I have all friends. He's one of my favorite people. And um... tell him that one of his biggest fans says hello next time you talk to him because <laughs> I, I just his stuff. I devour his stuff, and I have all of the books that he's written. And I find that book. There's just something about that book that creatives need to hear. And it doesn't have to be an author. You could be an artist. You could be a singer. You could want to create your own uh, startup business. There's something about anything, uh, yeah. anything he'll help. That book will help you to break through barriers. It's like you said, it's an easy, super short read. Mm -hmm. So powerful. I love it. Great yeah. book. Beautiful, man. So you said you kind of figured out you were a writer and then you started a blog. How yeah. did you figure out you were a writer? Were you dabbling, doodling every day? Because um, writing is really storytelling. So how did you know you were a storyteller? What were some of the signs? I just... I would find a way, I found that when I'm spending my free discretionary time writing, there's something there, right? And I would find a way to like, when I was writing the short story, I was like, I felt immersed in it. I'm sharing stories and making up characters. I'm, and I'm not a fiction writer. I'm a nonfiction writer, but I spent this time writing this story and I loved it. And it made me feel so good when I wrote it. And I wanted to come back to it. And I felt it calling to me. And I'm like, maybe, maybe I am a writer. Maybe. Because I think that's the thing about calling yourself a writer is I think we're all capable of being writers. That's why I think sometimes people tap out too quickly. Like, I'm not a writer. I'm not someone ghost write my book for me. It's like, I mean, listen, everyone's got to do what they feel is best for themselves. But I, I wish that some of these folks would push through a little bit more of the discomfort and just to see, because I mean, there's, you know, light. I mean, when I'm the, none of the three books that I wrote were, were all the books were painful. They all hurt. They're not fun. You're sitting here, you're looking at the blinking cursor that's taunting you to come up with something. And you're just like, all right, I got to string some words together and make sense. It's not an easy process, but I found that when you lean into it a little bit more and, and kind of say like, listen, it's within me. And as Stephen Pressfield talked about, there is, and I believe in the power of the muses. I believe that I can connect to something spiritually that can help guide me and help 
focus my work. That book in another book that's equally as beautiful is a uh, big magic by uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, Liz Gilbert. Oh man, that one is those two books together. And then maybe another one bird by bird by Anne Lamont. Like those are the three books that like, if you want to write something, they'll help you to realize it. So I tap into the muses. I tap into that, that kind of magical area that is inexplicable to most folks that all of us have access to. That's the reason why I'm not a writer. Like, well, maybe I'm not either, but I, I, I say that I am. And like you said, like, it's the difference between being an amateur and being a pro. Pro means you're going to show up. So I'm here. I'm showing up. I'm here for it. And then I'm not going to go to a place like, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not a, a writer. No, if I decided I'm a writer, just like I decided I'm a speaker, writers write, speakers speak. So, you know, I'm just going to keep doing it. See what happens. Hey, really quickly. If you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback. And back to the show. When you first started talking about your suicide attempt, um, what sort of reactions did you get and what surprised you? Oh, gosh. So the reactions were overwhelmingly positive. Now, as mentioned, I went 11 years before I decided to speak about that to anyone, much less on the stage. But I, I realized, you know what? Listen, I'm going... A funny story... Making work work, I lead off with, I almost, I, I, I almost killed myself. It was like the first sentence of the book. I wrote Making Work Work and I had the first two chapters of it written. And for some reason that I'll never understand, I, instead of saving my book onto my computer, I saved onto a flash drive that I would carry with me. Mind-blowingly dumb. And you can picture what happened in the next. I lost it. Lost the first two chapters. And that is devastating. I mean, as you're trying to write a book for the first time, to lose that and I searched everywhere, I couldn't find it. So I had to start over. And in the starting over version, I was like, you know what? Maybe this is, I'm gonna go, I'm, no, I'm not gonna dance around this. I'm literally gonna talk, I'm gonna start about my suicide attempt. If I didn't lose my first two chapters, maybe I would have had this milk toast thing, like how do we create positive environments? Let's see what the research says. Instead, I went a totally different path and it really paid off, so grateful. But back to your question, uh, yeah, very positive. I would say 99% positive. The 1% might be like, there's someone, well, well, that's kind of an overshare. Don't need to know all that stuff. It's like, grow up, like grow up. Like these are things that are happening. So it's a, the, the, no need to be weird. Oh, that's just, I don't want to talk about it. Like we have many people who are struggling. So worthwhile. What surprised me about all this though? What are the amount of people who are privately suffering? Because I talk a lot about this idea, like I thought I was the only one. And invariably after my talks, usually one of three things happen. One, someone says to me, yeah, hey, man, thank you for sharing. I am a suicide survivor myself. And that touched me. And I really am grateful that you shared. Two, someone says, you know, I've lost someone to suicide. I've someone's died by suicide that I love and yeah, it's tough. And I'm, and I'm, and I miss her. So there's that. And then the third one is like, Hey, real talk. I am, I I'm in a dark place and I'm contemplating suicide and have been. However, this is, uh, one of the hardest things for me to deal with and to navigate. And I, feel like you speaking about it gave me hope. So those things surprise me because, you know, we don't talk about suicide in our daily conversations often. So you never know who's struggling. So what it opened me up to the idea that we're all kind of broken in some way and we don't always share our brokenness with the world. And so when the people kindly shared their vulnerabilities with me, I felt like, oh my gosh, maybe I should speak about this more because people are feeling heard and feeling seen. And that's all I want. This is, oh, you're not alone. And maybe it's, and also as a black man, not a whole lot of brothers out there talking about mental health, talking about vulnerable things in a way that's as big, um, 
on stages like that. So I figured maybe I'll just lead the way and I'm full. I'm so flawed and so not perfect <laughs> to be the messenger for this. Maybe that's the reason why people kind of dig it. Cause I'm just figuring this stuff out myself. I have days where I'm like, I can't get on stage and talk about this right now. Cause I'm not in a great place, but I do. And I think because I'm so not the right person <laughs> to do this, um, maybe it makes me the right person if that makes any sense. So I, I just, I realize I am such an imperfect messenger. I just do the best I can. And I'm surprised by how willing and open people are to receive the message. Okay. So speaking of speaking, um, obviously as you speak on stage, you become more, uh, refined. Talk about some of the early er experiences. What, what were you doing that you look back on now and you kind of cringe? Oh God. And, <laughs> and what's gotten a lot better over the years? I mean, we spend like an entire episode talking about the things that, <laughs> that make me cringe on stage that I did. I, you know, I, I took a lot of people's advice and it didn't always pay off. And I would, and some of the advice was just terrible advice. I would, someone would be like, you know what? You smile too much. And I was like, okay, people are not going to trust you. Cause it seems like you're like a used car salesman. What you need to do is stop smiling. I was like, oh, okay. That seems weird. And I did it. I tried because I thought this person's respected. So I need to be more serious, be taken seriously. Also, oh man, you know, you, you need more academic studies, more rigor. What you should be doing is bringing like some white papers for folks to discuss amongst themselves at the, at the tables. And then the, let the research lead the way, let other people's work speak on their work. Don't make this about you. I was like, okay, I mean, that seems to make sense. So many things that were so wrong with all this. Hey, you know, you should wear all black. You don't wear color on stage because if you do, it's, it's going to distract from the message. You want to fade into the background. You don't want to be seen as someone's coming. Don't wear colorful stuff. Just fade in the back, all black. Just your message should be the thing that shines, not your clothes. Like I'm sharing with you the greatest hits of the worst advice I've ever received. And so all these things, there's so many more, but like those are the ones that come to mind. And the idea of like, not smiling, not being authentic. This is who I am. So there's that. Many people told me not to. I mean, I would say probably nine out of 10 people said, don't talk about suicide on stage. Please don't. Don't share that. That's that's going to make people uncomfortable and they're just going to tune out. So don't do it. And no one's going to hire you because no one's going to hire you talking about that stuff. So don't do it. And that was wrong. Um, the idea of having uh, white papers for people to read at, at on their own. And then I come back and debrief them during my talk. I did that. And literally people were falling asleep at the table. People were walking out on me. People were like meeting planner almost didn't pay me because it was so bad. And I was like, so like I had to chase her down for weeks. Like, where's my money? And it's like, that comes down to just authenticity. I know it's an overly used word, but I don't know if there's any way to connect more deeply to audiences of being authentic. Unless you're just authentically a jerk, then probably should be someone else, right? Don't, don't do that. But if you're authentically a good human and you wanna make the world a better place and you're not self-focused on you and you wanna actually deliver value to the people who are listening to you, if you do that from an authentic place, it will always serve. It will never fail. Only good things will happen. I just think that a lot of people don't think about it that way. Don't lean into it that way. And I was one of those people. So I cringe when I think about those times now when I see folks on the come up who are like these amazing speakers who are so authentic and so real and being told by supposed experts, oh, you should think about changing your message because I don't think audiences are going to relate to it. Well, then start, you, you be the first, you be the first one to do this. And I'm seeing people be the first and I love seeing that. And uh, conventional wisdom sometimes isn't always the best. And I found that to be something that I've leaned away from now and my stuff makes me cringe less. I'm always cringing at some of the stuff that I do, but I cringe less because I think now it's something that I, uh, I'm coming from a place of purity and authenticity that I wasn't before. And now that I am, I feel much better about the work. Yeah. I think Oprah has a quote. She says, if I knew how successful and wealthy I would become from being myself, I would have become myself a long time ago. That's a and beautiful it's so, quote. It's so true. I love that. 
Um, you have a quote in your new book, Civil Unity. Uh, it's a Ruth was how do you say her name? Ruth Bader. Yeah, Ruth Ginsburg. Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it really stopped me in my tracks. It said, "Fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you." Yes, That's such sage advice. What does that? How does that? What does that mean to you, though? So when I think about when I'm fighting for the things that I care about, civility, respect, improving our discourse, if I am coming at it from a place of attack, from a place of being on the offensive, using a way to make me come off as intellectually superior over someone else, then that's not really going to encourage people to want to fight with me. Maybe they'll be like, yeah, I'm glad he's sticking it to the other side or whatever it may be. But I found that if I'm coming at it from a place of like, hey, let's sit at the table together. We both want certain things. We both want respect. We both want to be seen. We both want to do our best work. We all want to be safe. Let's talk about how we can make this happen and come at it from a place of not villainizing either side, but or vilifying, excuse me, either side, but just creating an environment where we can come together and communicate with respect. It makes it easier for people to want to fight for that. Because I think almost everyone, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, whether you are cisgender, transgender, whether you are Jewish, Muslim, Christian, atheist, black, white, whatever, Republican, Democrat, I think we all want to have that period of time where we feel at peace and we feel safe and feel free to be who we are. So I'm coming at it from a place of respecting folks for who they are. And obviously this is putting aside the people who are actively out to hurt and harm others. There are always gonna be those people. I'm looking at that squishy middle of the folks who are just kind of could go either way and I want to get as many of them engaged in this fight as possible. The ones who are like, listen, I could, I can see both sides of the argument. And I like how you're speaking about it because it's a place of respect. And that makes it easier for people to want to fight with me because I'm com not fight against me, but fight in the same fight together with me so we can make this world a better place. Because I don't think people are happy the way things are right now. And they want it to change. They don't know how. So by me getting out there and kind of coming at it from a place of respect and seeing your shared humanity they're more willing to join in, which is really the whole thing that I'm going for right now. How do you see success, the idea of success today? I mean, you, you've made seven figures speaking, you've got a family, you've got a wonderful little dog, you have books, <laughs> you have all the things, but what does success look like for you today? It's funny. It's, it's almost the word I just shared. It's peace. I feel like you see so many people who make a bunch of money and way more than I could ever dream of making. And they're unhappy. They're miserable. They don't have their kids. Don't know who they are. You know, wife is having an affair with the pool guy. Like, you know, kids are on meth. It's like, you know, like all these situations that are like, even though you have the trappings of financial success, you're suffering so deeply on the inside. I crave peace. I want peace of mind. And I, 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 and that's something that I feel with, with this book, I find myself going down the path of like, oh, it's going to be a New York Times bestseller or else. I'm so proud of this book. And I, it's, I really, really think it's a really great book. But I also remind myself like, wait a second, peace. There's a lot of New York Times bestselling authors who hate their lives, hate their existence. and would give up their New York Times bestseller status for a day of peace in a heartbeat. So I, when I find myself getting driven by those ego uh, related goals, and there's nothing wrong with having ego related goals, I but I find myself if I'm driven by them, then I need to check myself. I'm like, listen, your goal is peace. And peace brings me a lot of things. It brings me happiness. It brings me clarity. I am a meditator. That's why I felt like you and I connected so easily. I find the way to just kind of center myself and to focus on the things that truly matter allow me to remain completely clear on what success is, is to maintain and prioritize my peace. And that's all I want. And if I feel, if I feel peaceful, I'm going to be a better dad, better husband, better speaker, better writer, better citizen. That's all I want. Just that peace. I'm probably a little further ahead than you are in terms of meditation, but you're a lot further ahead than I am in speaking. And I'm so glad you mentioned the part about authenticity because that's something I struggle with. I'm currently being coached oh. about, about, about bringing more research, you know, and I'm, I'm constantly grappling with sharing personal stories versus sharing, you know, more broad conventional anecdotes. So I want to thank you so much for, for that little part, because that's helped me a lot. Um, 
there's a guardrail out there on the 405. It's got a little stain on it. And <laughs> millions of commuters pass that guardrail without even noticing it every single day. And you, I'm sure, have passed by that same guardrail and it holds a whole other story for you. So what does that represent for you today when you pass by that spot? Uh, hope. And, and just the idea that I think hope is something that we really need more of in this world. I lost it so quickly due to the incivility and rudeness and unkindness that I was experiencing hope. And we're not alone. There's so many people here who are willing to help you give you love. Nowadays, when you think about like the suicide hotline, there's like, you know, 988 and other people that are able to help and serve and, and, and make this a better world. So it's, it's, for me, it's hope. It's like, I, things were always, there's never going to be a time, God willing, where things get so ugly that I need to tap out and just be like, there's an absence of hope. There's always a way. And even when it's hard and I've had a lot of hard days, there's always hope. And I think that's the one thing that I would always tell people is to lean into hope. And part of our responsibility, I feel is by giving those kind moments to others, those kind reflections, a smile here, a thank you here, a compliment there and helping hand shoulder to cry on. We may be that one person that grants that hope to someone who's on the edge, unknowing to us that they're even there. So that's why I feel like kindness and civility is more than just like the right thing to do. It, it actually can help be a life-sustaining and maybe life-saving life -saving force. Beautiful, man. It's a great place to wrap it up. We didn't even get into, you know, a lot of the concepts from the book, but hopefully this was enticing enough of an interview to get people to go and, and explore your book, Civil Unity, uh, go together, make work work, and also to follow you on social media. I mean, you, you, I just followed you relatively recently because you just post the most incredible personal stories oh, and they're so you. inspiring. And uh, so I, I highly recommend everybody follow you on Instagram. You also have a viral post on Facebook that went viral oh. during, during 2020, um, which, which is a really interesting concept as well that I think will be very eye opening for a lot of people. And you've, you've, in my eyes, at least become the mentor that you always wanted when you were a child, oh. you know, someone to give you, give yourself permission to be yourself and, and to be more civil and to, um, and to be okay with, with, being an empath. And so just want to appreciate you, give you your flowers. Thank you so much for taking time to come on to the show. And, Light. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again at some point soon. Heck yeah, my guy, man, you are, you're, you're, you're that dude, man. So it's always a pleasure to connect. Thank you so much for taking the time to interview me and to, to get real with me and to allow me to share my story and continue uh, lighting up the world with your light puns intended. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you. Absolutely, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.